Welcome back to Nickel Angels Comic Corner, Classics, Classics, Nine Classics. This is episode number 875 and Devil Shot number 769. I got two X-Men trades. Yeah, it's something though, the fact that I've reached 875 episodes. Yeah, by the time this day we finished, I'll be up to about 877. Yep. That's the two X-Men trades. First up, it's X-Men First Class Finals. One thing I should got point out, though, this is the same size book they used for Uncanny X-Men First Class, and yet the X-Men First Class trades were actually a lot bigger. This is just a four-issue limited series of X-Men First Class Finals. And, of course, they also have the classic Giant of X-Men number one in here. Because why the heck? Because the book kind of leads into that, even though there's continuity errors in this book. Yeah, there are continuity errors. Yeah, in a way there are. Mm -hmm. But some of the stuff in here, from what I can tell, does set up that particular book, but also sets up the Beast era. From what I can tell from this particular book, it takes place, I would say, just definitely prior to Beast's short-lived solo feature of Amazing Avengers, because they set it up in here, and definitely before X in First Class. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are basically the X-Men... Just revisiting something revisited over the course of the series. And hold the point of this series, just wrap everything up of this era. This is written by Jeff Parker and artwork by at least by several different artists on here. It's done by at least three different artists. You have Emilio Parenka, who does the breakdowns for issue two, and the pencils for issues three and four. Roger Cruz does issue one, but that's the finishes for issues two through four. Colleen Colover does does the X date one. The cover art is now by Roger Cruz and Val Staples. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I should also point out though that the X Men are in this book are actually not in the co like Cyclops in the cover. That's not the costume he wears in the book. Yeah, he wears his first individual costume. Yeah, all the X Men here are wearing their first individual costumes. Yeah, and one thing I do good appreciate with the cover about this trade, it's the it's the four connecting covers. Mm-hmm. In the rest of the stuff, they, they actually have, the course, a series like Jean Grey teaming up with with the Invisible Girl, a.k.a. Susan Richards, uh, on an adventure with them. The next day is simply just a date between Scott Summers and Jean Grey. Fun little thing. Mm-hmm. And plus, the first issue is just basically the characters revisiting... Now, they mentioned something with the Zox invasion that actually just happened... Back, and I think it was in issue 65, I think it was. Yeah, they mentioned Apple 65, they mentioned that. They mentioned Grotesque that happened back in issue 39, which they kill off the character Changeling. Even though we read the issue, it's Charles Xavier, but it was later retconned to be the character Changeling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and of course, the reason the character Frederick actually from the previous volume of X First Class. Yep. The Frederick character is only here just for the first couple issues. Yeah, there's a whole thing about the X-Men basically starting with the mental hallucinations. Yeah, it turns out this is actually done by Jean Grey. She had, yeah, by pure accident. Yeah, she's she has no control over this. Oh yeah, and the man thing story, yeah, man thing pops up in here as well. Yeah, one thing I gotta pull, pull, out, pull like, like an error here is they mentioned here they're going to Kuroda. Okay, there is a slight problem with that. Mm -hmm. because in the original story, if anybody read Giants of Texman, having a Polaris are there as well. Yeah, having a Polaris are here in this story, but yeah, here, it's like, Jet Parker, now, he did remember the fact Beast was not here, he did remember that, but, yeah, he kind of forgot the fact that having a Polaris is supposed to be on the roster at this point. Because look, here they are in Giant X number one. Look, there's Havoc and Polaris, and get this, they are nowhere in this fourth issue at all. There's no mention of them. Now, I get the fact, yes, the ending of this issue does lead into Giant X number one. Fine, whatever. But, I think it just, I don't think that's a plot hole, I think it's just a continuity error on the part of Jeff Parker. I think he forgot that Havoc and Polaris were actually part of the X at this point. But this is still fantastic. Love it. Give this book a 9.5 out of 10. 
And anybody, if anybody interested though about a series for X Men where it kind of fills in some gaps of X Men history, this one kind of does. All right. Next up is another X Men book. An X book that I don't think anybody's ever talked about. Nothing if anything of anyways. Excuse me. And this is Dark X Men. No such out. Just simply Dark X Men. This contains a five issue series Dark X Men written by Paul Cornell. Who is a British writer? He's known for writing Doctor Who comics, and he's also he was also the last writer of the of Logan before he before Charles Show wrote Death of Wolverine miniseries, and of course I work by Leonard Kirk. The big thing with this particular miniseries it's the return of X Men. Yep, X Men, a guy who died back in issue seventy five of his own solo title back in the nineties. Yeah, it had been a good about fifteen years since he died. It actually been good, good, like almost 10 years since he died. Actually, almost 15 years. Yeah, though it was hinted in the issue he could have possibly survived the explosion that killed him off in the final issue of his own soul title, this book confirms, yeah, he's alive. Now, those of you curious, though, who the heck are the Dark X-Men? Well, as seen the cover, though it used to be a lot bigger roster, you have... Now, those of you think, okay, you see the cover, I mean, you can tell in the middle, that's Mystique. That apparently is Beast. That's, you think that's Angel, this guy over here. Like, you're probably like, who the heck are the rest of you? I mean, you can tell in the middle that's Mystique. This actually is not the Beast of 616 Universe. This is the Dark Beast from Age of Apocalypse Universe. Just like X-Beast from Age of Apocalypse as well. Now, this guy's actually died and came back for some reason. No explanation for that. This guy here is not Angel. No, it's not. this is not Warren Warrington III thinking, yeah, that is. It's a costume. Right costume, right wings. No, that is not him. Look very closely. That is the character Calvin Rick, uh, Calvin Ripkin, aka Mimic. As this guy over here is, this is Melvin Potter. This is uh, this is Weapon Omega. He's also been known as the Guardian. Oh yeah, and this guy is also responsible for killing off Alpha Flight back in New Avengers number sixteen. Though apparently he got pardoned for that because he was not because. How he got his powers is quite bizarre, to say the least. Because after M Day back in 2006, apparently almost 90% of me has lost his powers. And where do those powers go? To this guy. And he can get this. Guess what his profession was before he became a superhero? He was a mailman. Not kidding about that. And there was also a joke about Affleck basically like. Like, off panel apparently killed off the entire Alpha Flight except one. He didn't kill off Sasquatch Survive, though they didn't stay dead for very long. No, he literally stayed dead for a good four years until they were brought back in Chaos War. And they're actually one of the very few people actually. Their, their group is one, one of the handful of people who actually stay alive after the event because everyone else either disappeared or just went back being dead. Yep. Now. Dark Knights used to have, like I said, a lot, a, a bigger roster. There were four. This this roster originally consisted of eight people. Aside from Mystique, Dark Beast, Weapon Omega, and Mimic, we also had Cloak and Dagger, Emma Frost, and Namor. And that was during the event you took, which set up this particular team. And then we get this mini series. I should point out, though, this is before Siege. Because it came out in 2010. Because Norman Osborn was in the series as well. Yeah. So. He sends him off on a mission to find X-Men. Who apparently is alive. They battle him also in the series. And they take him to custody. And he disappears for a little while. Before he returns to his immune. Where he's basically in the hands of. The Sugar Man. I'm not kidding. I'm serious what the guy's name is. The Sugar Man. Yeah, then he got added to Mutants for a little while. And he actually just returned the pages of Kenny X-Men. The first time in... Two years, I think it was? Yeah, it was the first time in two years that he actually shown up. Actually, it was like a year. Though, for some reason, the Raiders of Kenny X-Men kind of would be a villain. Yeah, though the current writers were Ed Bronson, Kelly Thompson, and Matthew Rosenberg. Yeah. Now, after this miniseries, the Dark X-Men were never seen again in Marvel Comics. 
they completely disappear. But this is a good miniseries. Gives one 9.5 out of 10. Dark Avenger needs to pop up in here as well. Yeah. But the weird thing about this group is, at this miniseries, this group was never seen again or even mentioned. There's no, there's no confirmation this group was ever disbanded. They just stopped appearing. Yes. Excuse me. The whole point of Dark X-Men is that they are, simply put, no one has ones bought and paid for X-Men. Basically, they're his X-Men. That's the whole point of this group. Oh, also, Docking was part of this group as well, but he was also starting bar Dark Avengers as well. So we had a good nine people part of this roster, though four of whom infected the real X Men, and Docking went back to Dark Avengers. Simple as that. Now, what has happened to these characters since then? Well, after this, Dark Beast tried to return, he returned to Age of Apocalypse Universe, succeeded, then he went back to his own universe. And we went back to six one six. Uh, disappeared for a while, died, and they came back. As for Weapon Omega and Mimic, they actually disappeared. They weren't sitting in for two years. They didn't show up again until the end of X-Men Legacy Volume 1, where Rogue was trying to save Mimic's life from being killed. And then, like, right after that, they disappeared. They weren't seen again until issue 300, which came out, I think it was in 2014, and that was the last time they were seen. As Mystique herself, well, after this, at the top of my head, she popped up in Kenny X Force. She popped up in, in the Age of Apocalypse 13 before the events of 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 the X Termination crossover. She was a recurring character pages of Wolverine the X Men. Popped up in Wolverine before Wolverine uh, briefly killed her. Yeah, this period of time, and I mean, and I think she did make a recent return to pages of Ed Kenny X Men. Yeah, she appeared there. She also was X Men. She was everywhere. She's actually the one person who stayed consistently relevant over the past nine years since it was released. And on top of my head, I think her most recent appearance was actually in issue twelve of Astonishing X Men, which came out last year. But that was the most recent appearance that she's made. But at least, unlike everybody else in this cover, at least she's appeared more than a handful of times. She's appeared, like I said, everywhere. And like I said, these times she appeared in. She appeared in Wolverine. Wolverine the X-Men. Uncanny X-Force. Wolverine, let's see, Wolverine X-Men. She appeared like everywhere. I mean, there wasn't a single x tile she did not appear in in the past few years. The only oh yeah, she even did recently make appearance not only in the pages of Astonish X, she also appeared in X Men Gold thirty. Yeah, she briefly made appearance in there. Aside from that, I mean, since issue twelve came out last year for Astonish X Men, she has dropped off the map. She hasn't made a single appearance since then. I don't think she returned the pages of X Men. Not that I can think of no. But at least that she's the only one who made freak appearance since this book ended. Yeah. But as the team itself, oh, God forbid we actually find what happened to them. Yeah, they're one of those many teams which, once the series wraps up, we just forget about them. We just pretend that it never happened. Even though we have this trade that says, yeah, they existed. We kind of like to figure out what the heck happened to them. I mean, what happened to the group itself? Did they disband? Were they inactive? Something. As far as I can tell, it's been nine years since the miniseries was released. There has not been a single bit of lip service to explain what the heck happened to this team after this book. I mean, it looked like they apparently did the Spanded after this miniseries, but it's nothing said about it. It's just that they stopped appearing. It's one of the things that baffles me about this group. I mean, this group was created by Matt Fraction of all people. To be sort of an evil X-Men. No, not really. They're just a bunch of goons hired by Norman Osborn to be the X-Men for, like, no reason. Because he got his own he got his own Avengers he bought and paid for. Why not the X-Men? And that matter, why not have his own version of Fantastic Four, the Defenders, the New Warriors, while he was at it? Avengers I get because they're popular. The X-Men popular, too. 
But here's kind of the thing. Per to Utopia, Norman Osborn never interacted with the X-Men. No, he never did. Mostly, he just interacted with Spider-Man. He did make occasional appearances in other titles. He popped up an issue for Thor, posing as a freaking corpse. He popped up an issue of Iron Man. But yeah, that's what he did for years until 2009, where he appeared everywhere. Well, actually, first at the Civil War, he appeared on the page of Thunderbolts, where he was the director, and then, of course, became director of Hammer. Yeah. As of currently, Norman Osmond's most recent appearance was last year in uh, Amazing Spider-Man 800. That was his last known physical appearance. I think he went up. I think he went to jail. Here's one thing I hope, though. Can some mob writer at some point have him tried for the murder of Gwen Stacy? Yeah, that's the one thing he's never been tried for, at all. And that's the weird thing. This man killed Gwen Stacy, and he's never been tried for it. He's been tried for other crimes, but not the murder of Gwen Stacy. It's one of the things that baffles me about Norman Osborn. Yeah, it's like we we tried for everything else. We tried him for like uh, I think it was like attempted murder of Peter Parker several times over the years. Let's see. I think he's been charged with murder of several people, but God forbid we try him for the murder of Gwen Stacy. Ball writers, at some point, can you please try him for the murder of Gwen Stacy? That'd make an interesting trial. And also, have one of these characters explain what the heck happened to the Dark X-Men. I certainly would like to know. I'm sure a lot of people would like to know what happened to this group because this group just disappeared. Yeah, it's one of those many groups which they just stopped appearing because of the book ended. And this is not the only book this has happened to. This has happened to A-Force. This happened to All New X-Factor. trying to think, though. What other group was? Oh, yeah. The Fearless Defenders. Yeah, their group just disappeared as soon as their comic ended. Yeah, there's a lot of groups from Marvel in the past, like, six years. that have just, like, in the past nine years, who have just abruptly disappeared just because their book ended. Which I think is stupid. You could, I don't know, mention they disbanded. Or they got shifted around or something. I like some lip service, mind you, but nothing. All right, so that's it for this particular review. Stay tuned. My next review is going to be for review for One Piece and another comic corner, which is going to be two more X-Men traits. Okay, but to use the next review. Bye.